Well, good morning. If I could just start off by saying that um, um, it is a humbling pleasure to be able to serve a church like this. Um, I know I can speak on behalf of uh, Diane and Stephen and Jeff when I say that we are just blessed to be able uh, to be here with you. Uh, all of us have served churches where the pastors are not loved. <laughs> and we know what that's like. We've seen that. But you aren't that. You love us, and we know that, and uh, we feel it. And it is our joy and our privilege to be here among you. Uh, we have some of our best friends for the rest of our lives here uh, uh, at this church. And uh, we're just really blessed and grateful to be here. So thank you uh, for making it easy. Thank you for making it easy. I really appreciate it. But now uh, I got to wrap up this message series and I'm going to get blamed when the service goes long. <laughs> Not my fault. Okay, we did something earlier. We did a thing. So uh, yeah, so we've been in this message series now for, this is week number 11. And we've been working on building a worldview so that we kind of know biblically how to think about the things that we come up against in the world that we're in. And the last several weeks, we've been kind of dealing directly with some cultural, you know, issues, some heavy things that we've been dealing with. And it's been tough. It's been a tough slog the last few weeks, but you stayed with me. And I really appreciate it. I appreciate you guys giving me encouragement uh, and affirmation. You've stroked my hair a little bit and told me it's going to be okay. Thank you. Uh, because we've talked about some heavy stuff. You know, we've talked about gender identity issues. And we've talked about gay marriage. And, you know, we've, we've kind of been dealing with all that. And I saved this one for last um, because... I know that when I throw this one out, some of you guys are going to be going, why is this even a thing? Why are we even talking about this? I threw it out to somebody the other day. They're like, really? Are you going to talk about that? Is that even, uh, is that even a, a biblical or a gospel issue? Today, I want us to talk about student loan forgiveness. And I know, I know, you're like, really? Is that even a, a biblical thing? Is that even a gospel thing? Um, it sure is a big thing. Uh, that's for sure. They've been talking about it in Washington, D.C. for years now. And this year, it was made uh, as an executive order that we're going to spend about $400 billion with a B dollars over the next 30 years to relieve student loan, to give student loan uh, forgiveness. So it's a big deal, and I really felt like I needed to address this when I saw the same meme on social media that you probably saw when this was all a big deal just a few weeks ago. Here's that meme that I saw. It says this. It says, how can Christians be against student debt forgiveness when your whole faith is based on being forgiven and unpayable debt? That's a good question, isn't it? That's a really good question. And it does seem like we Christians are the ones that are against this. You know, this always comes down to a battle between the, you know, political left and the political right, the political liberals and the political conservatives. And so there's always this tension, this always bump up thing. Why is it that we seem to be sticks in everyone's mud why is it that we're the ones that are always against everything? And why in the world would we be against debt forgiveness when our whole life is based on being forgiven a debt that we couldn't pay? We just sang about it. You know, it's what we build our faith on. So debt relief sounds like grace. Shouldn't we be people of grace? So in my mind, this is a huge biblical theological it's a gospel issue and so i want us to take our time today and be intentional about looking at how we should think about this with a biblical godly worldview 
So it's always between the liberals and the conservatives. And if you listen to the way we conservatives, I'm a political conservative, if you listen to the way we conservatives are portrayed in the media, you know, we're the ones that always want to take away everybody's human freedoms. You know, we're the ones that want to restrict everybody. We're the ones that want to eliminate the entitlement programs. You know, we're the ones uh, that don't want people to have a fair wage. We actually think that if you earn money, you should keep it, and it shouldn't be just given out to everybody else. We are the ones that actually think criminals should stay in prison. You know, if they were convicted of a crime, if they go to prison, we actually think they should stay in prison. And it's liberal, sorry, it's, it's political conservatives uh, that want to protect the lives of the innocent unborn, even if it's not the most convenient thing for the mom. Whew. That's tough, isn't it? It's tough. In our culture, that's tough. And if you put all that together, um, that doesn't sound like grace. It sounds like justice. It doesn't seem very graceful. It seems very justice-oriented. It feels like reaping what you sow. So what's going on here? Why, why are we so justice on the conservative side when the liberals want to be so grace? Shouldn't it be the other way around? Well, let's talk about this for a second. I want us to look clearly at what the scripture tells us about this. And I want to be clear about our terms off the top. So first of all, the first blank on your page is this. Justice is just oversimplified getting what you deserve. Justice is getting what you deserve. And the scripture is clear about justice and where justice comes from. Um, 2 Chronicles 19 says that we are to fear the Lord and to judge with integrity. For the Lord our God does not tolerate perverted justice. He doesn't tolerate partiality, and he doesn't tolerate the taking of bribes. God is a God of integrity, a God of righteousness, perverted justice, anything other than real justice where you get what you deserve that is an, anything besides that is an offense against God. He is holy. I'm going to say it again. God is holy. We happen to be reading a book about that right now in our life groups about the holiness of God. Psalm 89 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Unfailing love and truth are walk before you as attendants. So uh, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. The throne of the king represents the kingdom. The king sits and rules the kingdom, right? And so the throne of God represents the kingdom of God. His kingdom is clearly a kingdom of righteousness and justice, right? This is who God is, and this is what his kingdom is all about. His government is based on justice. In Isaiah, God speaks through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 1, he says to us, wash yourselves. Be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways and learn to do good. God is all about doing and being right. He's all about doing and being right. No bargaining, no negotiating. It's right or it's not of God. He is holy and just. This is his nature. This is his character. Are, are we clear on this so far? I just, I just want to make sure we're clear. I know I say this from time to time, but I know, I know a lot of us think that we've negotiated terms with God. You know, God and I have a deal. He knows how I am, and he's just okay with it. And I just want to say, you are lying to yourself. 
I want to say you're lying to yourself because God hates your sin. God's not okay with it. He doesn't just turn a blind eye to it. God hates your sin. In fact, he hates it so much that he says to us in his word that the wages of sin is In other words, if you sin, you got to pay. You get what you deserve. And if you sin, you die. God hates sin. If you read in Romans, you see the list of things that people are going to hell for. They're going to be paying for, and it's, you know, it's, it's all these nasty, ugly, awful sins, you know, so he's listing out all these terrible things, and you're going, yeah, 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 those people are bad. Those people deserve to go to hell until he lists things like being disobedient to parents. Did you hear me? <laughs> being disobedient to parents is a sin that brings death. God hates sin. He hates it so much that Jesus came here to kill your sin. I know we like to look at the grace side of Jesus, you know, catches the woman in sin, right? And the Pharisees are like, we should kill her. And Jesus is like, okay, well, he who has no sin cast the first stone. And then when they all leave, He looks at her and says, who condemns you? She says, well, nobody, I guess. And he says, well, neither do I. Go and sin no more. I know we love that part of Jesus, but I want to be really clear about why he even came in the first place. He came to seek and destroy your sin. He hates it so much. Listen to me, listen, listen. He hates your sin so much. He literally came to this world to murder your sin. And he hated it so much that when he did it, the way he did it was a murder suicide. He hates your sin so much that he took it all on himself and he went to the cross and he died and took your sin out with himself. You hear me? That's how much he hates it. God hates our sin. We don't talk about that, though, anymore. We don't talk about that. In fact, you won't hear a lot about the justice of God making everything right, especially if you go to church. Because the 21st century American church is all about the grace, right? We love the good news, and we just hope you won't learn about the bad news. We love to talk about how graceful, how loving, how sweet and wonderful God is, but we don't even want to mention our own sin. I know this. You know this. This is why we preach the gospel here, bad news and good news, because we know that a survey done recently showed that the gospel was missing in over 95% of messages in church on Sundays. We tell the truth about sin. And here in this church, you will hear us identify sin, and you'll always hear a call to repentance. Because that's how God feels about it. He absolutely hates your sin. He has a system of justice where crimes are always punished. Where you get what you pay for. In other words, I want to be clear about this. Ready? Firm, strict justice is godly. You hear me? That's not the way we talk about it in church in America today. But firm, strict justice is godly. If God is a just God, then we pay for sins And thankfully, Jesus stepped into our place and paid on our behalf. And I know for some of us, we're going, well, you know, I, you know, I look, look, Steve, um, it's not such a big deal with me. Not only do God and I kind of have a deal, but really the reason we have a deal is because I know people and, and compared to most of the people I know, I'm actually pretty good. I've never cheated on my spouse. I've never murdered anybody. I don't beat my dog. I mean, I'm I'm nice to people. I always give change, you know, up here by the Walmart when someone's asking for change. I always do nice things. 
I'm pretty good after all. And I want to say I'm kind of right there with you. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of there with you. I was saved at a young age, right? I was early high school when I got saved. I didn't have a chance to get into all the really bad stuff. So I don't have a long trail of broken hearts and broken dreams behind me in my life. You know, I don't have multiple horrible divorces. I don't, I don't have addiction uh, and stuff like that in my background. I don't have that because I didn't get into all that stuff. So you can look at me and say, well, you're, you're pretty good. But the truth of the matter is I was born into a bloodline of treasonous criminals against a holy God. And because I was separated from him by that sin, every breath I inhaled was a crime against him. Him. My very existence was an offense against God. We're reading this book about that right now. And chapter 2 is all about the holiness of God. And chapter 3 is all about the not holiness of me. Exodus 15 says, Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. God is holy and we deserve what we get we get what we pay for the wages of sin is death and God is a just God he hates our sin but wait 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 hold on hold on the liberal crowd will say hold on just a minute because I got a Bible too they'll say and you know I read how Jesus is a person of grace he's always given grace remember that woman who was caught in adultery he gives grace over and over again and they read the New Testament and they get a picture of something different they see a lot of grace there and so, so when they look at it through their grace lens it leads them to their policy positions on the liberal side they believe in wealth redistribution everybody deserves a good wage so we should take from the makers and give to the takers we should expand the entitlement programs as much as we can to help whoever might be in need you know and and that's progressive you know it starts out with FDR chicken in every pot Remember you studied that in history? Some of you were here for that. <laughs> Not you, Brent. You're, you're young like me. <laughs> but you know, it progresses. It starts off chicken in every pot, but before long it becomes free health care. You know, free cell phones. Free college tuition. They want to be all about grace and just take care of everybody uh, through the government. I just want to be clear on what grace is. Next blank on your page. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Right, Lauren? Grace is getting what you don't deserve. If justice is getting what you deserve, grace is getting what you do not deserve. Right, Lauren? Are you back there? Yeah. She'll still tell you the story. Um, She's in her 20s now. Not for too much longer. (laughs) <laughs> it goes away fast, doesn't it? It goes away fast. But she remembers a time when um, she wasn't too much older than her oldest child is now. She's probably four or five years old. I don't remember, but I, I just remember it was, a, it was a dark evening, you know, I guess, early in the evening and uh, in a winter time like, like we're coming into now. And uh, I remember her mom was making those Toll House cookies in the oven. Come on. Can I get an amen to the Toll House cookies in the oven? (laughs) Nothing will make your house smell better. Just a little sniff of heaven right there. Toll House cookies in the oven. And we were getting ready, y'all, getting ready for the cookies. But but my daughter, Lauren, she can, used to could be, not now, she used to could be a real butt most of the time. She would throw temper tantrums and be ugly and mean. And this night, this night, for whatever reason, she had chosen this night to just be as mean and ornery as she possibly could. She is yelling and crying and slobber going everywhere, kicking stuff, spitting. I mean, everything you can imagine. And we're like, shut up, kid. Shut up, kid. Right? We're trying to make her stop. 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 There's cookies coming. Stop. There's cookies on the way. Stop crying. But she kept going and she kept going and she was just being ugly. I mean, ugly, ugly. (laughs) 
So finally, finally, I just got fed up, fed up with it, tired of it. And I was like, that's it. I'm done with you. You're going straight to bed. No cookies for you. I'm the cookie Nazi now. <laughs> no cookies for you. So I'm like, you can't, you can't have any cookies. You're going straight to bed. So I drag her upstairs by her hair yeah. to her bedroom, <laughs> throw her in the bedroom, right? And she's in there crying and spitting and everything. I mean, it's just, it doesn't slow down. I remember closing the door and she's in there just crying, crying. And I go marching downstairs because I'm going to get a cookie. <laughs> Amen, dads. I'm going to get me a cookie. I don't care how loud you're crying up there. So we're downstairs enjoying our cookies, and meanwhile, the wailing and gnashing of teeth is still going on upstairs. And finally, after a while, it begins to, you know, subside. It begins to kind of kind of slow down. And I go up, and I listen at the door, and I hear her in there. The, the, big, the big crying is over, but she's still, you know, doing the, <laughs> you know, thing that they do when they're kind of on the downside of it hopefully so I don't know what came over me but here's what I decided to do I went downstairs and I put two cookies on a dish she'll tell you the story um, I marched upstairs and I went into her room and I said it's time for you to learn a lesson I said you do not deserve any cookies young lady but I'm going to sit down here and I'm going to let you enjoy these cookies because this is a picture of grace. And I want you to see how grace is getting something that you don't deserve. And so she ate those cookies. And she'll still today tell you the story that grace is a cookie you don't deserve. Can we find that kind of grace in the character of God? Huh? Well, absolutely, right? Ephesians 2, one of our favorite passages, says this, God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and he seated us with him. He didn't only just raise us from the dead, but he seated us with his own son, Jesus Christ, in the heavenly realms. We're seated with Christ. We were dead, separated from him, guilty, treasonous criminals, but he raised us from the dead and he gave us the highest of positions in his kingdom because we were united with Christ Jesus. Boy, that's grace right there. That's getting what we do not deserve. Romans 5 says that God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just and ruled over all people and brought them to death. Now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Somebody ought to be happy about that. Boy, we know, we know that we're guilty. We know that we're sinners. We know we deserve that swift and severe, strict justice but God gives us grace in the person of Jesus Christ. So, gospel writer John shows us something about the character of God that really kind of starts to bring this all together, this whole idea of both justice and grace. How we tend to want to pick, you know, one or the other. The conservatives tend to be all justice and the liberals tend to be all grace. But look what John says about the character of God in John 1. He says, from his abundance, from God's abundance, we've all received one gracious blessing after another. For God gave the law. The law was given by God through Moses. God gave us the system of justice through Moses, 
but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. John recognized that God is both justice and grace. We tend to think either or, but God is so big that he is both and. He is all justice and he's all grace. That's what the gospel tells us, that we justly deserve to be swiftly and severely punished, but that God gives us the grace of Jesus to take our sin away and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you don't get anything else, get this, get this. If you don't get anything else, these next two blanks are the things that will kind of help bring it all together here. Here we go. Uh, the first thing to get, next blank on your page, is that justice is God's system. God's system is a system of justice. All right, so he's all about the systematic justice for everybody. How does that work with, say, student loan forgiveness in Romans 13? Give to everyone what you owe. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Pay what you owe. Can you get an amen? amen. Pay what you owe. I'm, gl I'm glad you amen that because there's the back half of that sentence too. Give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Look, I, I know I'm just as guilty as you are about talking about those idiots up there in Washington. I've heard what you say about our president and about our senators that I totally disagree with. Holy cow, I can't even believe we got some of those people that we have. But it's my obligation. I can only be obedient to Christ if I give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Otherwise, I belong under justice. Moving on, because it just got heavy in the room. <laughs> uh, moving on. Psalm 37 says, the wicked borrow and never repay, but the godly are generous givers. Boy, I, I can't think of a more succinct picture of justice and grace right here. Proverbs 22 says the borrower is the servant to the lender. Right? Debt is always a trap. So God's system is justice. He loves it when every crime is paid for. He loves it when people get what they've earned. God's system is justice. But the next blank on your page is that grace is God's privilege. Grace is God's privilege. Justice is his system, but grace is his privilege. Despite what we've earned, God gives us what we don't deserve. Ephesians 1 says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault. Before the world was even formed, he knew all your faults. He knew every mistake you'd ever make, every crime you'd ever commit, every time you would break the heart of God. He was acutely aware of that. But before he even made the world, he loved us and he chose us to be holy and without fault in his eyes. What? God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Can I get an amen? amen? So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He's so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. Boy, he has got justice for us, but he gives grace to us. 
So why do these two sides always oppose? Why is there always this tension? Why does it seem like we, we just can't get along? Why do the conservatives always hate the liberals and vice versa? Why is this? Honestly, why do we vote against those liberal policies? And the reason is because liberalism systemizes grace. Grace isn't a system, it's a privilege. But liberalism systemizes grace. Liberalism robs grace from the privilege of God and turns it into a perverted governmental system. In other words, liberalism counterfeits grace. It's fake grace. It's not even real grace. When the state is the giver of grace and not God, why do you need God? If the state is the giver of grace, why should I have to work for a living when the state will take care of me? If the state is the giver of grace, what would Highway 515 look like if there were no penalties for speeding? Everything would go crazy if they really took their policies to the extreme, to the end. Liberalism systemizes grace, and it teaches you to trust the state, not trust in Christ. It also, fake grace makes grace appear to be free. So, for hundred billion dollars in student loan forgiveness costs somebody. Right? Free health care costs somebody. Those doctors ain't working for free. Right? The research and development for those medications is not ever going to be free. But fake Grace makes grace appear to be free. Free cell phones. Right? We'll, we'll pay your way for whenever you're off work, I guess. I don't know. Fake grace is the opposite message of godly grace because fake grace says everybody deserves a cookie. It's the opposite message of true grace. And, and here's, here's why I think this is an especially big problem in church today. When we don't give the justice side of the gospel and the grace side of the gospel, when we're not telling the bad news and the good news, what are we really doing? We're hardening the heart of the rebellious. That's what fake grace always does. That half picture of grace only, no justice, what it does is it hardens the heart because what it does is it tells me I can do whatever I want. There's no consequences. I can live however I want to live. It does not matter. God will just forgive me anyway. And it hardens the heart. It, it teaches us that I can do what I want. I am my own God. I rule my life. I'm going to say that fake grace destroys souls so that's why here at the Orchard Church we will always give the bad news and the good news we're going to always talk about the justice side and the grace side and we're always going to call people to confront their sin and to repent we're not just going to stroke your hair and affirm you and tell you that God loves you just the way you are he doesn't love you just the way you are Seriously, why do you think God loves you just the way you, he accepts you just the way you are? But the whole purpose of your sanctification is to change you from the way you are and to make you into something new, something beautiful, something that reflects the image of God. Because I know the way you talk to your family before you got in the car to come to church this morning. That doesn't look like God. I know what you looked at online the other night. That doesn't look like God. I know the way you treat people at work, and that doesn't look like God. He hates that. 
and he wants to kill it and he wants to shine his light in and through you here's the thing grace cannot exist without a system of justice grace is never going to really be grace unless there is a system of justice so how do we Christians walk this line how do we deal with both sides of God's character I think the prophet Micah gives us a really good insight on this and it's a very very popular verse very famous verse you're going to go Micah there's a book of Micah yeah there's a book of Micah um but you know this verse, or at least you've heard it before, Micah 6, 8, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you. Do what is right and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. Boy, this is huge. This is, this is really powerful. If we could get this, I think everything would change. So, First of all, the Lord's told you what is good and, and the product of doing what's good ought to be that we are humble God walkers, right? That we walk humbly. By the way, I, I know people that, that want to be real arrogant about walking with God. They want to demand their rights as children of God. I'm a child of God, so I deserve or I demand over and over again we see that the fruit of the spirit results in humility walk humbly with your God so the Lord's told you what's good be a, be a humble God walker and this is what he requires of you do right and love mercy do right love mercy do right vote for the system of justice but love to show mercy. I don't think I got to convince you. We live in a red county. And I don't really think I got to convince you to vote for the system of justice. Most of us are just going to vote that way. We want to see the system be successful. We want justice done. But what if, what if we actually loved mercy? You see, here's the part where I think we get hung up a little bit. I think we're all about criminals getting what's coming to them. And if the government's not going to do it, I'm going to be packing anyway. So they better not come to my house, you know, right? Wow, uh, touched a nerve there, huh? I think we're good on do right. But what if we actually loved mercy? What if we actually fed hungry people? What if, what if we chose to give up some of our own Christmas present giving pleasure and instead gave that to children who don't get Christmas presents? What if we actually clothed the naked? What if we actually treated our next door neighbor as if we loved them? What if we actually got our arms around the hurting and the needy? What would happen? I think, personally, that if we just did this, if we just did what is right and loved mercy, I think the federal government would go out of business because they would have nothing left to do other than what the Constitution actually says they should do. There'd be nothing left for them to do because the Christians would be the mercy givers in the name of Jesus Christ and there would be no more fake grace. It would be real, authentic, godly grace. So listen, I just want to be clear about student loan forgiveness. It's, I guess it's legal now. And I don't want you carrying any more debt than you have to. 
And I know for a lot of people, student loan debt is number two behind their mortgage. And if it's legal and you, you can get it, get it. But I don't think it should be the policy of our nation because all it does is rob the privilege of God and turn it into a system. So our humble response, last blank on your page, is to vote justice, but live grace. Not just love grace, live grace. Jesus tells the story about that day, that day when he gathers everybody. All of the human race is in front of him, and he separates sheep from goats. And he looks at the sheep, and the king will say to those that are on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom, the total system of perfect justice, my kingdom that my throne represents. Justice is yours. Inherit that. It's been prepared for you from the creation of the world. Why? Look what he says. Because I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. In other words, you inherit the kingdom of justice because you lived grace here. Live grace and inherit justice. Look, the government doesn't love true grace and mercy, right? The government doesn't love that. The government loves control. The government loves money, power, and control. And all they got is money. They throw money at all of the problems. And when has that ever fixed any of them? Do we have more homelessness today or less homelessness? And I could go through the list about crime, about all the stuff. It's worse now after all the government money throwing. All they got is money to throw at the problems. But what you have, what we have, will actually change the world. Vote justice and live grace. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that you are all justice and all grace.